Welcome everyone. Thanks uh, for having me here. Uh, and it's a great pleasure uh, to be able to present my work uh, to such an audience and you know, interdisciplinary uh, under global studies. I, I'm thrilled. And I want to thank uh, Hussein Yilmaz uh, Hoca and the Suleiman Center, of course, Abu Suleiman Center. Yeah, Semini Pek was not unfortunately here, but she was my student and friend and colleague. Uh, and yeah, Semin uh, thankfully sent Miguel uh, to help me. Uh, thank you, Miguel and Aisha Nusermans. Thank you for you know all of the you know logistics and dealing with all of this. Now it's a pleasure to be able to present this. This my work is a culmination of ten years. I haven't yet been able to publish for the reasons I, I hope it will become clear as I present. Um, my interest is, as uh, you uh, summarized, it's, uh, I'm interested in basically the relationship between Islam and politics, uh, specifically in Turkey, of course, but it is also obviously a global issue. Uh, and I'm also interested in the intellectual foundations of the relationship between Islam and politics, especially politics, of course, uh, but also how it's related to Islamic thought, as we can call it. Now, um, I'm basing my, my interest is, how do I, okay, here, I have to use this, all right. My interest in um, uh, here, focus uh, of interest is uh, not really native puzzle, because I Greg. What drives this work is more what I call the Islamic intellectual field. I will talk about those in a minute. In Turkey, contemporary, current Islamic intellectual field, field in Turkey that has kind of, um, in the basis of uh, the ruling AKP's uh, ideology as well. Uh, so to understand the current relationship between Islam and politics in Turkey, without which I don't, uh, I, you know, I think it's very clear now that we can't really understand politics in Turkey, let alone Islam like politics. Uh, but for this, I, I've been working on this project for 10 years, more than 10 years actually, but especially under this uh, EU-supported project for three years, and um, I come came to a point where I realized starting with Native Puzzle Kusakurek makes a lot of sense for the reasons I will also uh, express. But the most significant one is that Native Puzzle Kusakurek is uh, current president's um, maybe last remaining weeks. We don't know yet. We'll see upcoming elections. Mm -hmm. But um, the current president Erdogan's main ideological inspiration, personally Erdogan's, less so than AKP's, but personally Erdogan's main ideological inspiration. And uh, just to exemplify what I mean by this, I chose this quotation, which is also very significant in terms of what I'm doing, what I call Sufi political thought. Mm -hmm. Now, Erdogan uses this analogy, the Ferhat Shirin story, a lot has been using it for the past 15 years. Uh, Ferhat Shirin story is kind of a Persian-based story uh, similar to Romeo and Juliet. Uh, apparently, Farhat had to dig through a very impassable, difficult mountain to reach Shirin, but then they were deceived and they died together, you know, similar to Romeo and Juliet. But the issue is uh, how Farhat dug through this very difficult, arduous, you know, task, the, the mountain, uh, with, with love. This concept of love is very central. And this is what I'm going to be talking about, how this is based on Sufi uh, political thought. It, it's based on notion, uh, the Sufi understanding of love. This is what they, they're talking about. Now, uh, Erdogan uses this in his speeches. He doesn't make a reference to Sufism or anything like that, but this is very popular in Anatolia, Turkey. Sufism is very integral to, uh, culturally integrated into, you know, popular, uh, it's, 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 it's taken for granted and everyone recognizes. That's why love is a very significant concept. And he uses love. Uh, he says, we are Ferhat and you are Shirin. Ferhat dug through mountains to reach Shirin. Why do we want to reach Shirin? We, uh, to bring together our nation with the state. He, sees, he says uh, in other talks as well, Ferhat is the state, we are Ferhat, and you, the nation, the citizens are Shirin. We're doing everything for you, out of love. He uses this a lot in his talks, uh, and this comes from Nejib Fazl. Nejib Fazl also uses this in the 50s. Uh, he has been writing his book. Uh, 
Uh, he says, uh, the best, best example of the love, ecstasy, and zeal, this love and ecstasy is very frequently used in his Nizip Parsons work in this sense. Uh, it, uh, and determination that the ideal wants the individual plan is Farhat, who dug through the mountain to reach Shirin. We cleared the way for our cause. This is the cause that Erdogan also believes he shares uh, with Nizip Hazel and the rest of the um, all, all, he thinks all of Turkey, all of Islam, uh, but this is how he uses it. Our cause with the same pain and love that Farhat had. We used his pickaxe, our hands and our hearts covered in blood. This is the understanding that I'm focusing on and has inspired uh, Tayyip Erdogan. Now, Nizi Fazal just very quickly, why am I starting with him? Why am I focusing on his work? One of the first intellectuals to build, I'm claiming, um, these are my points of departure, one of the first intellectuals to build an Islam-based political ideology was, which was instrumental in the formation of the current Islamic intellectual field in Turkey, which is, in a minute, I'll talk about very briefly what I mean by the intellectual field. He's also, I think, I'm claiming uh, one of the pioneers of what I refer to as Islamic decolonial thought that has become the common defining feature of the intellectual field. And one of the first intellectuals to develop what can be referred to as Sufi political thought. So these are all kind of new concepts that I'm in trying to introduce through this work. Now, my main argument, there's a lot of things here, a lot of sentences, but this is actually, I'm trying to make one main point, which is at the end, the predicament of Islamic decolonial thought. But I start, these are the steps that build into that. My first point, I'm trying to demonstrate in this presentation what is referred to as decoloniality, uh, which current literature uh, basically, in general terms, defines it as the desire to break free from the hegemony of Western systems of thought, started in Turkey, I'm claiming, I'm trying to demonstrate, in the 1950s with the emergence of alternative Islam-based intellectual and political paradigms, or what I refer to as Islamic decolonial thought, uh, one of the pioneers of which was Nedi Pas. Uh, now, just in parentheses, I should say, I'm not going to be talking about this more, but in the background of this, there has been a rigorous intellectual debate about Westernization, critical intellectual uh, debate about Westernization since the er early 19th century uh, when modernization began. But here, what I'm focusing on, what I'm saying is that uh, Nidip Basel is a pioneer of, is not the intellectual criticism of West, but it's a political move, uh, which the colonial literature also emphasizes this. It's not only an intellectual movement, which has already existed before, but this is also a political move. He bases a political ideology, a political system, proposes a political system based on this. So this is what makes it uh, unique and and and. Uh, kind of a pioneer. Uh, second point, uh, Nedim Fazl's thought and political vision, what he calls the Great East Project, uh, which envisions an Islam-based political so system called the Bashujelik, the chief sovereign state, would, and an Islamic revolution, Islam in Kilab, uh, is empowered by the emancipatory promise of decoloniality. It's empowered by this promise of decoloniality, the desire to de link from Western systems of thought. Uh, Nidhi Fazl attempts to establish in its place a Sufi Islam-based alternative intellectual paradigm and political ideology, which I refer to as Sufi political thought, by offering a system that draws its legitimacy, which is what makes it I, I, uh, Sufi political thought, I think, I'm claiming, uh, from the Suf Sufi conceptualization of love. I will try to demonstrate this as well. The Sufi <clears throat> conceptualization of love is love of Allah, love of God, and uh, Islam is defined as being on this path toward unifying with God. Uh, there's no other Islam for uh, Nizib Fazl. Uh, and the predicament I'm talking about, this is the main argument, I'm saying that the, the Great East Project envisions a tight regulation of society. I'll also briefly try to demonstrate that, especially gender relations and family life toward ensuring enforcing that everyone, and by that he means men, and I will also demonstrate this, stay on the path of Sufi love and Islam. Uh, second, he promotes an unchecked, this vision promotes an unchecked rule that stands above the law 
And we see this also in Akeb and Erdogan's uh, approach uh, today, that he sees himself above law as long as you're on the path of love. And this comes from definitely uh, Nijib Kras. Is a total, uh, it is finally the main point I'm saying, the predicament is uh, here, uh, this vision produces a totalizing project that demands the suppression or elimination of rival Islamic as well as secular movements, thereby reproducing the same hegemonic logic that it seeks to dismantle. And a different version of a same similar hegemonic logic, which we see also, and last point, in uh, the AK, current AKP's turn to authoritarianism and also ethno-nationalism. Um, the primary sources I use are Nejib Fazl's uh, uh, Great East Journal that he started publishing in 1943, uh, and it was intermittently shut down, closed. Uh, I think he was thrown in jail for a while. He then he came back. I, I don't remember that. I should check. Uh, but then his his work was collected in these two books mainly. Uh, met monthly, he is very proudly presents this as the culmination of his work, uh, Ideology or the Ideological Lattice. Ideology is a idiosyncratic term that he uses. Nidhi Fazl is a poet, and so he uses a lot of very interesting uh, in, uh, kind of unique uh, terms and concepts in Turkish, so it was difficult to translate. Uh, and then the other book that came out later, but again based on his talks and um, publications, is called Western Thought and Sufi Islam. In this book, uh, he uh, takes every, all of them, and anyone you can think of uh, who are you know, well known in Western thought, starting from Greek uh, philosophers, uh, not only the main ones, Aristotle and Plato, but also others. You know, as, as one has at least short paragraph on every single one of these names. Going through Machiavelli, also, uh, you know, not only philosophers, but also uh, artists and uh, Michelangelo, for example, Durkheim, Kant, whoever you can think of, Nietzsche, Marx, uh, some of them longer, a couple of pages, some of them short. But in, in every single one of them, he's critically assesses in light of Sufi thought. So, and his main point is I, I will try to demonstrate that Western thought lacks, is too excessively materialistic and excessively reason-based. It discounts the human soul and therefore uh, it, it lacks morality, it lacks any humaneness and it kind of produces misery and unhappy people. This is basically what he's trying to say constantly. He, for some reason, has a couple of people he admires in Western thought, uh, one of them is, um, Lenin, <laughs> Lenin, because he, he admires how Lenin did not only stop in, in intellectualizing, but also went on and, and, and put his thoughts into practice. That's what he praises in Lenin. And he also likes Charlie Chaplin uh, for criticizing excessive materialism uh, for that. Uh, and then he also admires uh, Bergson and uh, Mondel, I think, uh, whom he met in France, he was in France, uh, for these are, I don't know, I'm not familiar with the works of these thinkers, but uh, I think for Christianism, uh, this religion-based uh, sort of political thought that he admires for that reason. Um, so these are the works that I'm looking at. Very briefly, let me introduce the larger project this is part of. Uh, that I've been working on for the last 10 years. Uh, what I'm trying to do basically here, again, introducing is this, uh, introduce the Islamic intellectual field in Turkey as a vast field of political theorizing. Not a debate on Islam, but a it's, it's a field of political theorizing. That's what is being done here. Uh, I want to develop the conceptual tools with which this field can be studied in its own terms, because I saw that using the classical concepts of Western political thought, like conservatism, liberalism, you know, democracy, all of it, it doesn't work. Just by using these concepts, found it necessary to develop the concept, understand the concepts with which these, these debates are carried down in the field itself. Mm -hmm. Develop a conceptual map using these conceptual tools in the field to determine the spectrum of alignments of camps. I will very briefly, I have to demonstrate, show you this. 
so that we understand where Najib Fazl and also Akif and Erdogan stand in this field in relation to other movements. Uh, and develop finally the notion of Islamic decolonial thought as a defining feature of the field. <clears throat> this Islamic intellectual field is a field of uh, political theorizing formed around non-academic institutes, mostly non-academic. Uh, after 2010, uh, they started opening up some of these institutes, starting the opening up uh, universities, and they started publication. So uh, that are kind of academically, you know, uh, refereed journals, but a few, uh, mostly with the support of AKP. But this started after uh, 2010. I'm looking at journals starting from 1990. And I'm looking at journals that have been published at least 10 years. I'm trying to kind of capture uh, those that can be more or less institutionalized schools of thought uh, and, and alignments and political movements. Uh, how, how uh, and, and RKP's politics also is based on this constitutes to, in the intellectual found, uh, sort of in the field Islam-based uh, political parties and the AKP are all based on this field, are products of this field. Uh, I wanted to, I also in the uh, research to how they bring, show how they bring classical and contemporary Islamic and Western intellectual traditions together, which is, uh, you know, uh, uh, I should say, all these sentences are like tips of icebergs. There's huge amount of stuff to be talked about under these points, how they bring, what sources they use in Western classical, as well as contemporary thought. Some of them only talk about, uh, you know, uh, very canonical works in Western thought. Others look at even Foucault or Derrida or, you know, the, 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 it's all there, uh, but selective. And it's um, interesting what kinds of references they, but I'm not going to be going into that now. I don't have time, but I want to mention that. These are all tips of icebergs. Uh, and there's a wide range of different perspectives, Sunni conservatism, Quran-based Islamism. We'll I'll talk very briefly about those. But uh, I should say most of them, some of them hate each other. Uh, but in the early years, oh, okay, and let me show, this is the kind of a, a depiction of the Islamic intellectual field. These are the journals that I'm talking about. These are journals, I all selected these journals uh, and placed them. This is a collage of um, uh, I made myself intentionally placed uh, uh, journals that I'm all using. These are all journals that have been published after 1990s. And currently, almost all of them are published. A few of them have been shut down. Those who are not supported by AKP, uh, financial problems are so not continuing. Some of them only online, but most of them are continuing. And uh, I intentionally place them because they kind of go from left to right. Those on the left are um, more leaning toward the left, or, or but how they are left is defined in this context is, is very different. Uh, I, I will also mention that. Uh, but those on the right are more nationalist, for example. They're more authoritarian on the right. Uh, the uh, three journals here, when you can see, I can't, I don't have a pointer here, but Baran, Academia, and Eilik on the right side here, uh, they are all following Nitya Fazl's line, Ibda, the Islamic. Great East Raiders uh, movement that is very active today and very much supporting uh, Erdogan. Uh, on the left, the top left corner here, Ishtirak is a Marxist leftist Islamic journal. Uh, and then all of these on the left are, some of them call themselves Muslim left. Uh, some of them don't like that term using left, but they are closer to the word. They're more pluralistic. Um, more pro-social, bottom-up politics. Uh, most of them, maybe all of them, but most of them are against Erdogan. They have been, but in the beginning, in the years of 2000s, when Erdogan came, came, came to power at party, uh, they were supporting it. So that it's gradual kind of departure from, and let me just say quickly up from the beginning, uh, I will try to demo, I, I won't have time to go into this, but what happened is when Erdogan AKP came to power in 2002, uh, this, this whole field was supporting him. Because of decoloniality, I will argue that, because of this desire, Erdogan skillfully, AKP at that time, skillfully brought together different groups, not only in the Islamic field, by the way, 
of those secular groups who wanted to detach from um, the kind of uh, hegemony of Western thought that was institutionalized in Turkey through Kemalism. Uh, so he brought together, so this whole field was supporting Erdogan and AKP in the early years, but then eventually, I mean, it came out through the interviews that they said the first splits, for example, uh, Ethan Eliacic, who's known to be the inspirer of anti-capitalist Muslims, this left-wing Muslim movements, uh, said in person how he detached from this whole thing in 2007, as early as 2007, when uh, the AKP started consolidating more power and uh, you know started kind of partisanship politics. Uh, so eventually, we see AKP kind of support to the AKP going down, narrowing, narrowing down to the furthest right. And especially the uh, nationalism issue has been a big issue because this whole field, except for the very right wing groups, is very anti-nationalist. Uh, they are pro-Kurdish. Uh, they want to include the Kurdish movement. And they were saying, praising AKP's uh, Kurdish resolution process that started in 2009 uh, to integrate the Kurdish uh, and solve, resolve the Kurdish issue. Uh, uh, they were very much supporting that. But then Erdogan backed down and allied, made an alliance with uh, the ultra-nationalist party in 2016, 15, uh, starting in, and then. Uh, that's why many of these groups started withdrawing their support. Um, now, Necip Fazıl Kısakürek, born in Istanbul, sent to France to study philosophy at Sorbonne University. But then he was a very heavy drinker and gambling habits. He dropped out and went back, came back to Turkey, turned to Sufism, Nakshibendi Sufism, I'll talk about that in a minute, that's significant. When he was 30, after falling into an existential crisis, due to his unrequited love for Nokta Nokta Hanım's dot dot lady, this anonymous lady that he doesn't talk about. He has a poem called Nokta Nokta Hanım, but he uses that a lot, this uh, lady. But um, that's also significant, I will tell you, because love, you know, you, uh, what we seek uh, in, you know, what we, right, he always uh, assumes that he's talking to men and it's men only. What we as men seek in women is actually uh, wrong. What we really seek is love of God. So a woman is a distraction. Uh, I will uh, demonstrate why this is significant and it's also political work. Uh, he's renowned for his literary work, poems, plays, stories, novels. He has been studied much more as a literary person than for his political thoughts for this reason. Uh, and he established the Great East Journal in 1943. Um, the key concepts I'm using, I'll just quickly go over these to uh, conduct my analysis. But this is this is the most maybe controversial part of the issue, but I, I find it very important. How can we use the coloniality notion of decoloniality in Turkey, which has not been colonized? Uh, so I'm, 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 uh, men, I need to mention that coloniality, which was a concept uh, coined by um, Anibal Akihano uh, in the late 90s. Um, Kihano, a Latin American, uh, South American uh, academic, who then Walter Mignolo drew upon and started this decolonial project from Duke University, where he's now. Um, this uh, coloniality, the term of coloniality, which, uh, as I state, Kihano argues, that uh, comes after independence is achieved in the colonies. So, uh, and it's referring to the colonization of the imagination. What he's talking about is this, even though there has been independence, political independence and the de linking from the West and it's independent, establishing independence, the, in the mind and the imagination, the superiority and dominance of the West continued, the assumed superiority that through Westernization, through other means, where um, the West certain systems of thought and cultural practices were uh, considered to be universal, singular, and adapted as the only way to modernize. So he uses coloniality slash modernity slash rationality as the same thing. It's the, he calls it the colonial um, matrix of power. And this is a state that starts after decolonization, uh, you know, independence has been achieved. Now, I'm arguing that um, it's kind of in the backdrop. Um, uh, Turkey 
was not a colonial power, but it did fight its war of uh, independence against colonial powers uh, in 1918, 23, uh, the independence war, uh, which was led by Mustafa Kemal and the Grand National Assembly uh, and established a republic in 1923. Now, Kemalist modernization project, therefore, afterwards, right afterwards, started a stateless led West-oriented secular modernization project that adapted uh, European modernity as the universal norm and framed the Ottoman system and Islam as inferior, backward, uncivilized. I've written on this before. My previous work is based on this, so you know I, I, I kind of feel at ease to say this here, uh, that this is exactly how it was uh, the Kemalist modernization project was institutionalized and was the dominant hegemonic mode until the 2000s when AKP came to power. Um, the coloniality in the the adoption of European modes of modernity, uh, political, legal, and economic institutions through westernization created an increasingly restless intellectual debate and political activity that questioned the hegemony of West-oriented modernity and the institutionalization of Western systems of thought and knowledge as the universal norm, to replace them with local alternatives. This is not only unique to Islam. I'm not going to go into this, but this is my larger project that I want to pursue for a long time, it seems. So there's so much to be done. Um, in the 50s, I'm going to be trying to demonstrate how it started with Najib Fazl in the 50s through, among Islamic circles. But then what we see in the 60s, um, it skips to left-wing secular nationalists, uh, the Yuan movement, uh, which uh, is very secular nationalist. And this became the basis of, in 2000, Ulusalci movement, which also affected the Turkish military. The Turkish military also started to take a very critical stance against West Europe and Westernization, which was very, uh, you know, uh, uh, contrary to the military's previous position until 2000s, where it was a very big supporter of Western Kemalist Westernization. The, in the six, uh, 70s, I just wrote an article on this, so I'm kind of thinking of uh, also pursuing this line. Uh, Countercultural movements in the 70s, uh, especially based on arabesque, which is a musical genre, but also films were made kind of similar to rap. But again, we see a big, uh, kind of criticism, a very heavy criticism of the excessive materialism and immorality of uh, Westernization. Brought to, uh, it's not the West, it's not Europe, it's, it's Westernization and the Westernized lifestyle that dominates Turkey in the, at the time is seen as very harshly criticized in this cultural movement. Uh, then we see in the 80s and 90s a localist turn with this, uh, I'm not going to go into this here, but what is happening with this decoloniality is this desire to delink from the Western, you know, what is seen as the hegemony of Western thought, systems of thought, leads uh, in Turkey, all of these groups are looking for local, uh, the term I'm using, we, 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 in our project group, we discuss this a lot, should we use nativism, should we use indigeneity, but the term used in Turkish, it's yerlik, and the best translation of that is localism. I, uh, nativism, indigenism doesn't work because that's there's no native indigenous populations. We're not talking about populations. It is localism. That's the right translation anyway. These localist movements return to localism, especially started in the 1980s. And then with the 2000s AKP, we see it as spearheading, AKP spearheading the decolonial stance in politics that was able to bring together different groups. Uh, look, I just talked about this. I'm going to very quickly rush through this slide. Uh, Islamic decolonial thought, decoloniality, decolonization of knowledge, Anibal Chiano and Walter Mignolo. I'm using, uh, now this literature does not use this term. These two terms I just had to develop myself. Islamic decoloniality, that's why I put them in the quotations, is a term I'm using to refer to this desire to break what is perceived as the hegemony of Eurocentric Western epistemic esteem over Islamic knowledges and ways of being, as well as the adoption of uh, Westernization as part of the Kemalist founding ideology that has been termed as self-colonization by some of the Muslim intellectuals. Um, I, I'm using Islamic decolonial thought as an answer response to this Islamic decoloniality 
the motivation to, to, to break uh, from the hegemony of Western uh, esteem, uh, and in its place bring non-Western perspectives, systems of thoughts and ideologies based on different understandings of Islam. Uh, Islamic decolonial thought as a common feature of the uh, intellectual field. Uh, other key concepts I'm basing now this slide, there's three years of work behind it. Uh, so it's very difficult. This is like the three biggest icebergs in my work. I'm just mentioning the tips. This is where I start, realized without understanding these concepts, especially what I say, and these are the kind of epistemological kind of approaches in Islam, three key main approaches in Islam. Uh, that I had to dig through. There's no literature that looks at it this way. Uh, but without um, these concepts kept coming up over and over in the publications and interviews. And uh, that's why I had to formulate it like this. I would be thrilled if someone comes up and challenges and says, no, it's not that way this way. You know, open up for debates, but this is what I came up with. Now, there are these three main basic approaches, and Najib Fazl falls under the third one, uh, we just say, but uh, these are the three main camp set kind of explains the whole distribution of this intellectual field. The Quran-based approach, Quranic Islamism, is basically what we understand as uh, uh, political Islam today. Uh, it's, but it's based on the Quran. Uh, so, you know, what the argument is here, we can solve, we can seek, look for solutions to current problems, not only Turkey, but also humanity's problems, global problems, everything, uh, by interpreting the Quran. Uh, so everyone should read the Quran. Um, the Quran should absolutely be translated into Turkish. This is reason-based. And it says in the Quran, they say, how we need to use reason uh, uh, to understand, you know, our context and, you know, use, but uh, there are a lot of things in the iceberg I won't go into because I won't have any time left even now. Um, but uh, this Quran-based interpretation of, the, uh, of Islam is rationalist, reformist, modernist. Uh, some of them are progressivist in the sense that yenilikçi is the Turkish word. Uh, they're kind of very future oriented. Let's not look at the past, let's look at the future. We have to create our own, based on the Quran, our own concepts and very anti-nationalist. Uh, some of these, the Muslim leftists here, there's a group uh, I will at the end very briefly mention an association called the, uh, Havle, which is a Muslim feminist association. Uh, their motto is localizing feminism. And on the, based on the Quran, it's very interesting stuff they're doing. Uh, they have uh, feminist theologians, for example, that are cooperating with them. They are also in the school. They would not call themselves Islamists, uh, but they do call themselves Muslim feminists, and they do use the Quran. So this is a Quran-based understanding of Islam. The second group is Hadith-based approach. These are the traditionalist Orthodox Sunni conservatism. This is the mainstream official understanding of Islam, also dominant in Turkey. Uh, this is Nakilji. Nakil based is, is that the truth, um, this is mostly based on the Ashari school of Islamic thought and theology, which says that the Quran is not uh, rational. You cannot, humans are not meant to understand the Quran. Uh, you can't read the Quran. Uh, so what, uh, only the, the prophet was sent for us to understand the Quran. So we can only look at what he says. This is Sunni, Sunni Islamic thought, and not all uh, schools of thought in Sunni Islam. Hanifi, for example, is also open to rationalism, but but still, this understanding of uh, inaccessibility of the Quran is still even in Hanafism. We see it. If you understand, if you need to understand the Quran, you still need to look at uh, the Sunnah, the practices and teachings of the Prophet. So this is Hadith-based the understanding of Islam. It is empiricist in the sense that then how do we know which hadith are real and which are not? You look at very carefully uh, developed methodologies in different schools of thought in the mezhebs uh, that say you need five independent. The other one says, no, you need two. Uh, whose uh, testimonies are we going to look at? Uh, you know, the first Salafism is here. Salafis say, 
only the first two generations after the, that's what Salaf means, the uh, peers of Prophet Muhammad, only the two generations after Muhammad are the valid sources, can be the valid sources. Other than that, no hadith is recognized. So this is the more traditionalist, more strict understanding of, but this is what I mean by empiricism. Uh, and Sufism finally uses the notion of mukashefe, comes from, you, you see this now in Najib Fazl a lot. Uh, this is where love comes into being. Uh, the concept of mukashefe is to keshf, comes from the root keshf in Turkish also used, which means discovery, but it means mukashefe is a Sufi word concept, and it means uh, truth, knowing Allah or any truth, hakikat, can only be attained through an inner experience that is beyond reason and beyond also senses. So it's against both empiricism and reason. Now, the first through reason-based rationalism and empiricism are the two main camps, epistemological uh, you know, positions in Western thought as well. But the third one is not. The third one, this is, this is important because Najib Fazl is trying to say, wait a minute, Islam is this? For him, Islam is Sufism. And this is what West lacks. This is uh, kind of spiritualist, you know, the kind of knowledge, the true knowledge that we can acquire can only come from being on the path of love. And this is why uh, rituals, it's an experiential knowledge. It's not an intellectual knowledge. And this experiential knowledge comes through experience, which is what zikir is, the rituals that tariqats, the Sufi orders, practice many different versions, including the whirling dervishes of, this is the zikir of um, Mevlevi order, uh, comes, uh, it, it's to experience love of God. So this is where this notion of love becomes very central. Uh, now there's also, however, Sufism are in Turkey, I'm looking at not anywhere else, it's, it's, uh, unique. this is unique to Turkey. Um, there are two main, Camps, the overlaps a lot of them, but you see the journals also uh, distributed around this. Mainstream Orthodox Sufism is Nakshibandi, dominant order in Turkey is Nakshibandi Sufism. Here, Mukashefe, this act of experiencing God is a communal, and this is where uh, Nedjej Fazl is. We will see in a minute uh, how this is Nedjej Fazl's dominant understanding of Sufism is reflected in his work. Um, Mikhail Shefe uh, here is a communal experience. Zikir is performed in secret. Uh, and devotion to Allah is measured by obedience to the Sheikh. So the Sheikh has, is, and the Sheikh is a holy, due to silsila, lineage, it means lineage, linked to the Prophet through Abu Bakr, uh, and it has a very hierarchical structure. So because the Sheikh is holy, no one questions him. Uh, him. Uh, although there is uh, not an Akshibandi though, Sufi order, uh, the Ruf, Ruf, Sufi order where you have female sheikhs, it's, it's an exception. Uh, now, under Nakshibandi Sufism, Mujandidi Nakshibandi is significant, which is also what Najib Fazl is, we will see that in a minute. Mujandidi Nakshibandism uh, uh, accepts the Sharia. Other Sufi orders don't. Uh, it recognizes Sharia in the 17th century, or maybe later, I don't know the exact time, but under the Ottoman Empire, which means it recognized state authority and Sharia as the ultimate uh, kind of framework of Islam, uh, which is also significant. Uh, and they have very close connections with the state, the Bandi order, not directly involved in politics. Uh, they don't have a political ideology in itself. Uh, which is what Nezi Fazl tries to do in a different way. Uh, but this is significant also to understand why Nezi Fazl is here. Uh, on the other hand, we have unorthodox Sufism. Uh, these are marginal. These have been much older than Nakshibandi Sufism, dominant in Anatolia. However, they have been prosecuted by the state. Uh, that, that's why most of them are secretive, much more marginal. But interesting, we have in the intellectual field today, for example, Muslim anarchists who are, come from this Malamatiya uh, Sufism. They are very much against the state. They're, they are much more uh, devotion to Allah is a personal quest, not a communal one. Uh, 
Sheikh is either an unholy guide like a dervish or the dede of Bektashis, uh, but it's not holy. So there's no silsile or anything like that. It's, it's just a guide. Uh, and more egalitarian, more pluralist, increases emphasis on freedom. And uh, now I just gave these two examples. Uh, on the top, you see a very, today, very powerful, very integrated with the state, supported by the AKP and Erdogan supporters, the Menzil uh, Tarikat, who's a, on this exactly this orthodox, what I just uh, tell, told you about, and that's the picture of his their leader. And on the bottom, you see this, this is a popular Imam rocker, rock singer, who uses Sufi uh, themes in his songs, Mevla Yegel, you know, come to the Mevla and, you know, uh, and he, this is exactly a, a good example of unorthodox Sufism, but it's not very widespread, although supported by some of the, there are also like Athena, for example, not in this group, but uh, who's again, a popular singer in Turkey, was also part of a Sufi order. Um, now, Native Fazl's conception of Islam, uh, here, Islam is Sufism for Native Fazl. Uh, he, uh, this is a place where neither the head, nor the mind, nor the word can go. For him, Islam, you cannot understand Islam or become a Muslim just by knowing things or just by adhering to the rules. It is a practice, it is an experiential process, and it can only come from Sufism for him. The ultimate principle of Sufism is Ruh Chuluk, spiritualism. He says, you know, the, uh, beyond the laws of dry knowledge and reason, this is constantly comes up in his work. This is the main point of criticism that he brings to Western thought as well. Uh, beyond dry observation and dry experience, this dry, he uses this a, a lot. Uh, and he also, he uh, mentions a lot uh, in his work, supremacy of Mujaddidin Akshibendi Sufism. He doesn't use these terms, but he says, those who accept Sufism as the basis of religion alone, and he means he intentionally also calls out uh, Mevlevism, for example. He rumies Sufism as he's critical because of this. They say who reject, they should reject Sharia, and these men, what these men do is blasphemy. They're nothing but tricksters. He's harshly criticizing other non nakshibandi Sufi orders as well, as lacking the right uh, perspective. He's critical of akalji rationalism, his rationalism, reason of reason. Truth cannot be reached through by reason. He's also critical, and this is for him, this has started in Turkey with modernization in the early 19th century, with the in, in introduction of Western thought that Turkish uh, you know, life and state and, uh, moved away from the Sufi Islam. But he's also critical of uh, Nakhilji, sorry, traditionalist understanding of Islam. And he says this started all the way back in the 16th century with Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent, who started uh, introducing uh, administrative practices and laws outside the Sharia. Uh, and this is again in the hands of, and he's also critical of the ulema who's doing this, like uh, who's seeking ultimate authority in their knowledge of Islam, Hadith, and the Quran, in the hands of uh, crude and vulgar fanatics. And he's talking about the ulema here, uh, who lack any wisdom and originality. So he stands in somewhere in between these two, and he's critical of both understandings of Islam. Nidhi Fazl's definition of human, for him, human is a, is a Muslim on the path of love. No one else is human. It is by directing love towards its original goal, Allah, not woman, but Allah, uh, and its creations that the human becomes a human. So for him, and also human is male for him. Uh, this is a previous preface in one of his plays. He says there's Allah and then human before Allah. There's death and human before Death, human before society, human before woman. You can see what he means, you know, what, what he's excluding or what the, his notion of human. And the last quote I'll rush through, but he's now talking about this anonymous lady that he fell in love with. He's, he's addressing her, but he's also addressing women in general. This is also significant in the way he regulates uh, his projects, uh, seeks to regulate uh, society. Uh, that men needs to be protected from being misled into looking for love in women. 
Okay, so that's a misleading thing. This is what he's talking about here. Now you're useless to me. You're nothing but a dream, a shadow, a likeness, a symbol. Uh, regardless of what you can give me, you will not be nothing but a warning that you lack the power to give love. Woman cannot give love. The only source of love is God, Allah. So that's where you need to do. So that's why men need to be protected in his mind, in his project, from following, looking for love anywhere else. Um, his great did the coloniality, how it appears in his work, he talks about this love. I think this quotation best exemplifies that. He says, our ultimate cause, this is a direct quotation from him. These are the, his words that he's using. Uh, to end in theory and in practice, the catastrophe of captivity into which we have been deceived in return for a bargained independence. He's talking about Kemalism. Kemalism bargained his way through independence by giving up, uh, by falling captive into what he calls a catastrophe in, in theory and in practice. It's not only intellectual captivity, but also political captivity he's talking about. So the movement needs to be also a political movement against it. To ex extirpate the bitter knot of Western supremacy with all its regimes, laws, notions, customs, tools, tastes from within us, we have to throw it out. Uh, and he says to understand our causes, to understand colonization in which the imperialists outside have condemned us through their imitative spies within us, again, talking about Kemalism, under the banner of Westernization. Uh, these are all his words. Now, this is my uh, controversial translation here, the epistemic struggle. He says, our cause is much more arduous and formidable than the mountain Ferhat tried to dig through. Again, going back to the Ferhat story, we need an epistemic struggle. The third word he used is tefekkür cehri. Tefekkür means uh, intellectual, I guess, or, or you know, in thought. But I translate it as epistemic. I don't know that can be debated. Uh, but this is what he means in the area of what Kihano said, colonization of the imagination. This is exactly what he's talking about. Actually, tefekkür may be uh, translated also as imagination. Because tefekkür has, is, it's a kind of Sufi related term. It has this more, um, uh, you know, emotional context, uh, context as well. Uh, we need an epistemic struggle so torturedly devoted that it almost suffocates. This is his dramatic kind of uh, way of articulating his views. This work has weaved together fiber by fiber. He's talking about his book, Ideological Lattice. Um, fiber, fiber, fiber by fiber, a system that will save Turkey, the Islamic world, and all of humanity. So he's not only talking about saving Turkey or the Muslims, he's talking about saving all of humanity. This is how he sees his ideal. Now, I'm um, just skipping that. This is how he criticizes Western thought for being too, um, for, I like, I like the way he words this, consists of nothing other than an unprecedented, enormous procession of material and plastic construction. He's criticizing excessive materialism and excessive um, rationalism which leads to and you know, defeats itself, self-defeating kind of dryness. Um, now, Sufi political thought. Why am I calling it Sufi political thought? Because I'm arguing that the legitimation of the system that he builds is based on the Sufi notion of love. So how, otherwise you can't understand without looking at this the Sufi connection, you can't understand why in a political kind of manifesto of his ideology, his book, Ideological uh, Lattice, the concept of love and ecstasy appears many, many times, tens of maybe close to 100 times. And in all of this context, it's always used as a legitimation tool. Uh, if, like Sparhat, you know, he does it out of love. And he says um, uh, the kind of rule is political authority will always find the main source of its authority all its decisions and directives readily available as long as its spirit shines with love and inspiration. So, uh, you know, if you're doing it out of love, this is repeated so many times, this is some uh, closest uh, quotation I found, but it's all over his book. This notion of if you're, because the rulers are doing everything they do out of love, they're fine. They can't 
go wrong. So there's no check, of course, you know, that as, as long as there's love, that's okay. But this is, again, like I said, Erdogan has been using, we are Farhat, you are Shirin. We do it out of love. So what we're doing is right. You know, it's good for the good of everybody. No one asks Shirin what she wants, of course, but, you know, <laughs> that's the issue. Um, and legitimation of nationalism He's also, you know, uh, unlike the larger Islamic intellectual field, Nedim Fazl is a very Turkish nationalist. And this is overlooked in the Islamic field, by the way. Nedim Fazl is very widely celebrated in the Islamic field today uh, for his decoloniality. And most of them, because most of the field is anti-nationalist, of course, there's a contradiction here, but uh, they overlook it because, you know, other things. But I think it's significant because it kind of helped justify the ease with which Erdogan switched from uh, you know, Kurdish resolution process, anti-nationalist position, to immediately siding with ethno-nationalism. And today he's very adamantly nationalist. He's, he's, he's racist almost against the Kurdish Kurds. So uh, Nedim Fazl helped that you know, under, uh, very much. And here we see how he legitimizes also Turkish nationalism through Sufism, by the way. He says, Turks are the only uh, community in the world to uh, materialize Sufism, which is a spiritual thing, this love of God, Turks are given the mission to make it real, okay? to put into this is how he expresses it. Um, well, it's all about sprinkling. <laughs> I, you know, this is his you know, unique way of uh, articulating himself. It's all about sprinkling the Turks' personal and national soul treasure. Uh, on this foundation of love from which its spirit, spirit will blossom, take shape, crystallize, and be engraved in matter throughout time and space. It's all about putting into material form this love of God. And Turks are the only ones who can do this, he, he maintains. So he kind of justifies the superiority of Turkish nationalism, as supremacy, he says, supreme nationalism, he calls it, uh, based on Sufism as well. Uh, the Grace Peace Project, this is finally my final slides, um, regulation of society, the predicament that I'm talking about, although it kind of uses the emancipatory promise of uh, decoloniality, he has been using this a lot, and this is why his views are supported in, and have been very influential in the Islamic field in Turkey. Uh, and Erdogan does the same, by the way, he uses the same, uh, I, I'll give you a few examples. Uh, he says uh, his plan to regulate society, our cause, will have a whole plan that encompasses the institution of marriage, educates children and young people, and ensures constant submission through both legal measures and personal indoctrination within the limits of religion. Uh, what he's trying to do here, regulation of society, with lo long articles and uh, you know measures in his book, uh, talks about, and many of them are related to regulating male-female relations, and they're based on this notion of how men, human uh, equals men, need to be uh, kept by the state on the path of love, uh, and they will be distracted by seeking love in, you know, in, in personal relationships, and therefore they have to get married uh, very early, they have to put, be put on the uh, path very early, and also all kinds of adultery, uh, prostitution, all these have to be very strictly banned because they veer the men, citizens, away from the true path of love. So this is again why his notion of Sufi Islam equals Sufism, it's not about uh, how many times you pray or how you do or do you fast in Ramadan or anything like that, it's about this. So uh, this personal relationship, gender relations uh, become very central to his thoughts, regulating society. Uh, he, I gave the example of dancing, why dancing is prohibited even. This is just one example. He goes down to regulation of bed and breakfasts, hotels even, all for the same reason, okay? You have to keep protect men from falling into being tempted by looking for love in women. So all these places also have to be tightly regulated to ensure that. Uh, there is no difference between dance and committing adultery in public. You know, so you have to control also dance. Um, this is the predicament I'm talking about. And this predicament is also reflected in his political thought. 
uh, what he, uh, he ends up creating the same hegemonic logic that he criticizes. The hegemonic logic is that uh, the legislative, it lives in ecstasy and love. It is devoted to nothing other than this cause. Again, no uh, check, no power to check the legislative is necessary because it does everything out of love. And then other uh, different visions of Islam and you know, uh, society and state is uh, uh, the penalty for absolute blasphemy is absolute death. Uh, and he's, he says, the penalty for every vision and attempt that puts this country under the command of blasphemy and deception with communism at the forefront is execution as soon as it is proven. Uh, so yeah, it's a hush. And then he says, until there's only one woman and one man left who will be the core of the society of our dreams, it is necessary to scythe the whole community if necessary and to accept our move as the most advanced manifestation of justice and mercy. So again, you know, very tight authoritarian rule is justified. And this is, but these are not very widely quoted in the Islamic intellectual field today. They're overlooked, they're not debated, this part, but I think it's significant when we see similar understanding here with, the, with my uh, last two couple of slides. I think I over went a little bit, sorry. Um, Today we see this, I, I just gave how uh, uh, Erdogan is still using this Farhat Shir uh, 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 analogy as uh, early, uh, as recent as 2022, November. Uh, he still uses this. Uh, so to justify how we're doing everything out of love, the same understanding of legitimation of rule, also of, of uh, legitimation, which means that we don't need to adhere by the law. And we see this a lot here at the bottom I mentioned. Also his nationalism, I just mentioned that, so I'm skipping, but these are all, these two slides on the right uh, are to demonstrate how uh, nationalism took hold very strongly in this thinking right now. Uh, and Erdogan also, where there's a disregard for law and the law and the constitution has become the norm, uh, which is fine by many of the Islamic circles who follow this line of thinking. Uh, we see uh, the coloniality in the AKP today as, as taken hold also. Uh, this is pro-AKP journalist Yusuf Kaplan, who just recently wrote, uh, there are some leashed grasshoppers in the Turkish academia and the media who speak with the language of the mentally colonized epistemic slaves in love with their executioner. These are his words. He uses the word epistemic. So what we're seeing is that this decolonial thought, which is, they haven't read this uh, literature is not, they're not familiar with this literature. They're very familiar with postcoloniality. Uh, they use it a lot, but, but this epistemic decolonization idea is, has become uh, no, standard language among them. This is, the other quote is from, again, just a couple, six, five, six months ago, Minister of Finance, Kurt. Nurettin Nabati said, all epistemological breaks are ours, break from the West. This, this is his word, epistemology kopush. He uses the word epistemology. Epistemological breaks are ours. We never rely on imported economy commissioners. He's talking about when the opposition parties, secular JHP, hired Jeff, I forgot his last name, an, an American economic uh, econ economist as an, an advisor. And in response, this is what the uh, Minister of Finance said, you know, they, we don't ever hire Western, we don't rely on them. Kind of. So this is, has become very popular in, uh, these are just two examples, very widespread views by, this is my last slide. I just wanted to push this in because it's not only Najib Fazl and his followers and AKP. These are, uh, this decoloniality, uh, this epistemic disobedience and Islamic reconstruction initiated by Najib Fazl has, um, unites otherwise diverse and counter-hegemonic movements in the intellectual field, some of which adamantly contest Najib Fazl's uh, stance. Uh, the examples I give on the right is Havle Association, which, which works with the lo uh, motto localization of feminism. And if you can see, and you know, it's very small fonts, if you can see it, but on the right side of the seminars talks, and they're uh, supporting the LGBT movement, um, feminist movement, uh, but also Islamic feminists. There are, they call themselves Muslim feminists. 
And this localization, the term localization is used by them uh, in a very much decolonial sense. Uh, so break from the West, feminism is not only the Western concept, we need to develop our own feminism, but in collaboration with Western feminists. So it's not a rejection of the West, it's not a, you know, but it, we have to do it our own way, emphasis. On the left-hand side, there's a labor movement. Uh, it's a very popular um, movement, labor and justice platform. Uh, and they're kind of, uh, they use the Quran. Uh, some of them, uh, one of them is Ihsan Eli Açık, one of their intellectuals. And Ihsan Eli Açık gives Quran courses and he says, heaven described in the Quran is communism. Because, you know, it's a left wing, but non-Marxist. It has nothing to do with Marxism. He doesn't use Marxist terms. He just says basically that Quran favors, if you read the Quran, this is very reason-based, very, this is what I mean by progressivist Islam. Uh, mism, is, they don't like the word Islamism, but they do use Muslim left. Uh, these are also anti-capitalist Muslims uh, movement is also here. Um, they criticize capitalism definitely, but also the Western hegemony and they want to develop a Quran-based leftist Islamic movement. And they're doing it, they're very active. They're supporting all sorts of um, labor movements. They're also supporting LGBT movements, feminists, uh, and very pluralist. And there are also secular groups here. Uh, those secular left groups who agree, not all, some of the secular left groups in, uh, in Turkey today uh, are very adamantly against political Islam. I should mention this whole, uh, let me go back to that. And this is the end of my presentation, but I'll let me leave it on this slide. Um, here, this is the intellectual field that I'm talking about. And um, okay, let me leave it there. Question. Sorry, I took a little too long. Thank you very much for this very